Hey guys, Peggy Blue here for Pat's Punk Playhouse, and today, since I'm a music channel, and as you may have already seen, I am a very avid CD collector. Um, I don't really do uh, a lot of CD collection videos nowadays, because um, um, those uh, videos don't really seem to get that many views. It's probably only getting like a few views, even on the... Uh, old channel and it doesn't seem like there's really a lot on the new channel right now so um i kind of more or less stopped uh doing that but hey if you guys want you know the cd collection videos back hey let me know in the comments below but since i am a music channel or at least i try to be a music channel i thought that today i would be going over the top 10 albums that i own and uh this took me a while because i have probably a hundred something CDs. I know I had triple digits a while ago, so I couldn't really tell you how much I have right now, but either way, it's a lot. But, so anyway, um, I picked 10 CDs that I own um, to the best that I can. I rank them from one to 10, and without further ado, let's just get right into it. Starting off at number 10, and the number 10 spot is anti-flags for blood and empire um so uh the first song i guess i really listened to was probably the press corpse and that was because it was on one of the tony hawk skating games i think it was downhill jam i believe and i think there's another song on one of the pro skate series i'm not sure which one it is and i'm not really sure which song it is but i think that there's another song in the another anti-flag song in the pro skate series but yeah, I um, really love this album, actually. Um, probably my favorite album by them. And uh, from what I heard, I think they're making a new album sometime within the next couple years. But uh, either way, I uh, really love this album. Um, I actually did a cover of The Price Corpse, actually. Um, and, you know, if I ever... Oh. And the CD fell out. Way to go to me. Yay. So... I actually did a cover of The Press Corpse, and um, it was excruciating, to say the least. Uh, the vocals, they were a bit difficult, because they were a bit outside of my range. I mean, drums were pretty easy, guitars were pretty easy, but the bass line. Now, let me tell you about that f all right, so at the number nine spot, we have The Clash, their debut self-titled album. And uh, this uh, CD and the, their album London Calling, I actually got from my uncle, who is a drummer, actually, in a uh, local uh, Wisconsin band called The Rain Dogs. This is probably definitely my favorite Clash album of all time. And uh, my girlfriend, Cheyenne, she also loves this album, too, and... I think she said that this was the first ever, like, punk album she ever listened to or she ever got. I'm not really sure. I probably have to ask her when I get a chance. But, anyway, really iconic album. Kind of really kind of kick-started the whole, you know, punk rock movement, especially in England in 1977 when this came out. And it's just awesome, and I love to death. So, at the number eight spot, I forgot how to count for a second. <laughs> is Green Day's Insomniac. This, I pro I was debating on whether to choose this or Nimrod as the number eight spot, because um, I love Nimrod, um, mostly for two things. One, it's a, it has a healthy amount of experimental new stuff that Green Day never did, and it also came out the year I was born, so... Um. Yeah, there's that, but I also, but I had to go with Insomniac because it's simply because it's their most punk rock sounding album ever. It's... Awesome, it's just breathtaking. There's probably not a bad song on this album. Um, the only problem I have with uh, this uh, CD in particular is that once it gets to Walking Contradiction, it tends to skip um, some bits and pieces. Um, it's not a significant amount, and in reality, I probably should just get a new, I should probably just get like a new CD, but I don't really see the point of that, because I already have this, and it's just the long song, and it's not even that many skips, so... And, you know, if I really wanted to listen to the song, I could probably just go on to, you know, YouTube or something and then just, like, Google it. I know that's, that sounds like a contradiction to me, but... <laughs> contradiction! Ha! I really like this album, and I guess I'm just too late to get a new one, because I don't really see the problem with this one. I mean, there's just one flaw, so... 
you know, it doesn't really seem all that bad to me. Coming in at the number seven spot, we have The Offspring Conspiracy of One. And I don't want to say this is my first Offspring album that I ever listened to. I think that was Smash. Um, or at least it was um, probably uh, Not Self-Esteem, uh, self Come On Play. That was the first Offspring song I ever re really listened to. I really do love this album. It's probably my... Uh, tied with uh, my next I'm here for my favorite Offspring album of all time. Um, like I said, there's not a bad song on here. And, you know, it's technically 13 tracks, but uh, the first track is just intro, and it's literally like five seconds of uh, Dr. Holland saying, when we're ready, we come up to the mic, and it sounds like this. Seriously, that's the whole song. It's like five seconds. So it's technically 13 tracks, but in reality, it's only like 12. So, you know. It's nice, it's short-ish. Well, it's not short, but it's also not long. It keeps, it's long enough that it keeps me engaged in uh, listening, but it's not too long that I start to, you know, get bored of listening to it and it just drones on for me. So, th and that's what I really, really like in this album, or in any album, really. All right, coming in at number six is, an, is my other favorite Offspring album, Rise and Fall, Rage and Grace. Now, I think... This is actually the first album that the Offspring did when um, there was just the three of them, where there was just their uh, singer, Dexter Holland, guitar player, Noodles, and then their bass player, Greg Kay. And I think they just had a studio drummer for all of the drums and percussion on this album. I can't really tell for sure, but you can't, I mean, you couldn't really tell because uh, with the Offspring, they had like 800 different drummers. Like, that's the thing with a lot of... Uh, a lot of bands I've noticed is that they'll always have like the same lineup of like the same three or four people, but they'll always switch out some other player, whether it be the bass player or the guitar player, even the singer. It's it just I don't know. It just goes on. I really love this album. It's uh it's kind of you think a lot of people would say that this is kind of a more emo esque kind of album, and I guess the only real emo songs I guess you could really say are on this album for me are uh, Fix You and Christy Are You Doing Okay. Those are the really only, I guess, emo-ish songs on this album. Every other song I think, I think it's just, you know, like a fast-paced hardcore punk song to me. But, I mean, to each their own, but either way, I really love this album. Number five spot is The Descendants, Cool To Be You. And... Uh, interesting fact about this album, uh, this album, uh, which I believe came out in 2004, I believe, uh, let me check, uh, uh, yep, copyrighted 2004. The album before this actually, which was Everything Sucks, that actually came out in 1996, so there was about an almost an uh, eight-year gap, so almost a decade between that and their, between that album and this. And actually, funny enough, they actually just released their new album, Hypercafium Spasnate, back in 2016, I believe. And so that means, and that was the album that came out after this, so that was a 12-year gap. So right now, my theory is that their next album probably isn't going to come out until like 2032. It's kind of weird because it's um it's a really kind of hardcore punk song or punk sounding album, but there's also like a bit of personal emotional lyrics in this like uh one more day. That's um that's kind of more of like a personal song. What I've noticed it's kind of like about cuz I think what I got from it it's essentially about this guy and that falls in love with this girl and she dies. But you would never know that if you just listen to the instrumentation, because it just sounds like every other, you know, punk song. It's just, you know, guitars, bass, drums, doing whatever. And then you hear this, the lyrics, and it's, and then it's just, whoa, okay, this is actually serious. It's about somebody that died, and it's pretty personal. So that's what I really like about that song, and kind of like what I really like about this album in general. It kind of just, like, pushes the limits of, like, what punk is, because when it first started out in the 70s, it was kind of more just about, you know, either politics or society or some other third controversial topic. But, you know, as the years went on, there uh, there were a lot of songs that started, or a lot of bands, rather, that kind of just really pushed the limits on what they could really write about. And, you know, 
they got a lot of controversy, especially from the punk community, but you know, they didn't care and they really just stuck to their roots and I really think that's good. And that's, I feel like what the Descendants were really going for and you know, I think that's really cool. Coming in at the number four spot, we have Bad Religions, Stranger Than Fiction. Uh, there's not really much I can say about this album other than it's great, it's my favorite Bad Religion album of all time. Uh, a lot of people will say Suffer is Bad Religion's best album, but I really think that goes that honor really goes to this album right here. Um, so about this album, uh, so the last song is 21st Century Digital Boy, and there's actually, and they actually already wrote that song, but uh, it was in their last album, Against the Grain, or it was in a, it was either in a previous album. It was in Against the Grain. I can't remember when Against the Grain came out, but I know that this came out in 94, I believe. But either way, they did, uh, they added 21st Century Digital Boy on two albums. Um, I actually really prefer um, the version that's on this album here, because um, on, again, on the version that's on Against the Grain, it kind of just has more fade out ending, which, I mean, it, I think could be good uh, when used correctly. But I don't really think that Bad Religion really used that correctly in that version. And so I guess that's really why I like this version better. Alright, coming in at the number three spot, we have the Ramones debut self-titled album. And uh, I really love this album because I'm pretty sure this is uh, probably my first introduction into punk rock um, at all. Well, this is probably the first introduction to, you know, punk rock as we know today at all. But, um... I think I remember, I remember uh, hearing Blitzkrieg Bop for, from uh, that one scene in Jimmy Neutron, um, the movie, not the actual show. But uh, I can't remember which scene it's from, but I just remember that song and it was, and I was just listening to it and for me it just sounded like, whoa, this is actually really good. But honestly, like I said um, for the last few albums, uh, there's not really a bad song on this album. Like, I could probably listen to this album for hours on end and I would never get tired of it. And I'm just a big, really big Ramones fanboy, as you can tell by, you know, that poster. And there's also a couple posters over here you can't really see that are off camera, but it's whatever. Coming in at the number two spot, we have another Ramones album, Brain Drain. Uh, I believe this is, um, I think either this album or the album that came before this was their last album that had their original bass player Dee Dee Ramone on it. Um, I'll check it later when I get a chance because I'm doing this. But yeah, it's a really cool album. It's kind of um, kind of a horror, hardcore album. Uh, I really think that this is probably one of their um, better albums, again, aside from their debut self-titled album. Because it just has that really, like, hard, like, edgy, kind of slightly scary sound that kind of kick-started, I guess, what we would know as 90s punk, really. You could really say this kind of set the, kind of really set the standard for a new decade of punk. Alright. And then, and now, and now, for the grand finale, the number one CD that I own is... My Chemical Romance, I Brought You My Bullets, You Brought Me Your Love. I have probably listened to this CD more than I have heard my own parents talk. Um, I've, uh, sadly, this is not my first uh, My Chem album that I listened to that I believe was uh, The Black Parade. But uh, once I first discovered this album, I was just in love with it. It... It just took my breath away, the instrumentation, the vocals, on everything, it was just, it's just phenomenal. Like, again, like I said, there's not a bad song on this CD right here. Um, the only uh, song I probably would skip is probably the intro track, which is Romance, which, it's, it's not really a song, it's essentially a minute of radio static with like some sort of acoustic Spanish guitar playing some kind of riff. So it's not really a song per se. I guess it's kind of like um, the Conspiracy of One intro where it's not really a song. It's kind of just like introduction to like, hey, here's the album. So 
Um, yeah, like I said, there's not a bad song on here, but if I had to pick a few of my favorite songs off of here, it would probably have to be Drowning Lessons, uh, Head First for Halos, and then probably Early Sunsets over Monroeville, especially that song, because that song, I don't know why, it just gets me, it just gives me some kind of like massive nostalgia feeling, even though I probably didn't discover the song until I was probably maybe like 16 or 17. But it kind of just like brings me back to when this album came out back in, what was it, 2002, I think? I really, really love this album. And uh, from what I heard, I think I have some sort of special version of the actual CD. Because it has, not sure if you can see it, but it has like some little words right here. And they say, hold on, copyright 2002, Eyeball Records. Okay, so it did come out in 2002. Uh, My Chemical Romance, unauthorized duplication is a violation of applicable laws and will result in Gerard coming to your house and sucking your blood. <laughs> Which probably sounds extremely emo, but again, this came out in 2002 when emo was kind of really kicking off. But the thing is, I don't really consider it that much of an emo album. I kind of consider it um, really like a post-hardcore punk album, really, because... Um, I mean, there's a bit of, there's a few slow songs in there, but for the vast majority of it, it's a pretty fast paced album. And if you take a look at the slip cover right here, uh, you'll see, um, there's some words here, uh, which is Merci pour le Vien, which is French for thank you for the venom, which is actually a song off of Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge. So maybe that was like a bit of a spoiler or maybe they just put it on there cause you know, they're AJ's fuck. <clears throat> but either way. Uh, love this album. Definitely would recommend it. Not just to any MCR, punk, or emo fan, but I would just recommend this period because it is an awesome album. I can listen to this for days on end without any kind of break or without any kind of, you know, outside contact with the world. That is how much I love this album. All right, so that is my top 10 CDs that I own. Um, maybe for my next video, I might do a top 10 worst CDs that I own or maybe a top five because um, most of the CDs I have, they're pretty good. There's not really too many albums that, or too many CDs that I don't play. Uh, but if you have any suggestions for what you think I should be doing in my next video, make sure you comment them down below. Make sure to leave a like on the video and don't forget to subscribe. And once again, I'm Pat Keebler and I'll see you later.